Thanks for the intro, John. Um, yeah, uh, you're not fearless, but, but I'm a software guy, and I, everything hardware scares me, so this is why I'm writing this talk. John just left the room because he's like, I'm, I'm not too fearful. Uh, cool, yeah, thanks for coming to this talk, everyone. Um, it's not a very informative title, but that was intentional. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, we'll design a small ALU. I apologize in advance uh, if some of this stuff is too basic, um, but I'm, I'm just going to go ahead with this. Uh, so here's like a very simple specification of a really dumb ALU that can only perform additions and multiplications. Uh, and you, know, you, you have some op, which is a one bit value, and based on that, you either perform the addition with the two inputs, L and R, or you do the multiplication, and then you return the output. And sort of nominally, the kind of hardware you're going to build, you're going to sort of instantiate a bunch of blocks, like the adder and the multiplier. Um, you're going to send the inputs into them. We're all hardware people, so we can actually, we know that we, we can sort of perform the computations in parallel, use a mux at the end, and select the output we cared about, right? And so you can go ahead and try to build this, and uh, sort of here's a made up uh, RTL language where you get to sort of, you know, it's so very simple. It has just some different keywords. So what we're doing here is we're defining a component called ALU. Uh, it takes a bunch of inputs, op, left, and right. Um, it instantiates a bunch of circuits, the add, mul, and mux, and then you know, forwards the wires in the correct places and performs a computation. Right? So if you run the circuit, you're going to sort of run, run it with the adder, and you're going to get the correct output. If you try to run it with the multiplier, for some reason, you're going to sort of get the wrong output, right? Again, you have to imagine this is me, a dumb software guy, writing this program and being surprised that nothing works. Um, and so, you know, uh, you, you sort of ask your friends, you ask John, hey, how do I debug this program? And he'll be like, you do this. You look at the waveform uh, very carefully, and you'll see there's this big number flowing through right there, and that's, that's your problem. You're sort of reading some corrupted value or some, some value that's not ready. and so. Somehow, I've, I've caused this problem in sort of one of the simplest programs I can write in, in, in my hardware design, right? I was all happy I was trying to build hardware, and, and this is where I end up. So after digging it into, a, into this problem a little bit, I realized that the fundamental problem is that the adder and uh, multipliers are two different kinds of circuits, right? The adder is a combinational circuit. You sort of apply your inputs to the adder, and you get the output out immediately in the same cycle. New word, haven't heard of that before. Um, and the multiplier is sequential. You, you sort of take several cycles to perform your computation. But here's my problem. I looked at the interfaces. I read them. I read them carefully, and they look the same. right? I take two inputs. I produce the output. There's no information about adders being different from multipliers. So the fundamental problem that this talk and this work is about is that these interfaces that we're used to working with in, in our beautiful hardware description languages is they don't capture any of the timing or the structural constraints of the hardware we're working with. And in order to build correct hardware, we need to think about these things. right? Normally, you'd read some documentation that tells you about these behaviors. But it'd be super nice if you could just look at the interfaces and know that our circuits are somehow different. right? So. The software community has used a lot of types to encode uh, interesting kinds of constraints on the interfaces. So let's look at our typed HDLs. Um, and of course, we, we have to talk about Chisel. Uh, so here's, here's the example from yesterday's talk. We have our uh, filter that we're building, and we, we got, get to specify sort of you know, that our bit width is an integer, and our coefficients are a sequence of integers, right? Like already more interesting complex types than we're used to seeing in Verilog. But, but this doesn't capture anything about the timing behavior. And you know, if, if you uh, are a programming languages person, you might have used or heard about Clash, which is in uh, Haskell, which uses an even, fu even funkier uh, syntax to describe the type of your module. But again, nothing about, the hard, uh, nothing about the underlying timing and sort of structural properties. Same with BlueSpec, again, uh, even more funky uh, syntax, nothing about the sort of timing behavior of your design. Right? And so this language that I'm going to talk about, called filament, uh, is, is designed fundamentally to capture the timing and structural properties of your hardware designs. And so the first idea in filament is all modules are par parametrized with some set of events. So in this module, we have the event g. And you can think of g as this module starts at some time g. It's not quite it, but let's, let's just go with that. right? So when we get to specify that this module starts at g, immediately we get to say that the 
inputs are acquired in some interval. So the way to read this interval is g to g plus 1. That's out of half, op half open on the right, which means it's out of the first cycle. right? As soon as this module starts running, we need to provide the input L. And sort of on the outputs, we have similar looking sort of signatures. And those specify the, the, the times when the outputs are semantically valid. That means when the output will have some meaningful value with respect to this run of this uh, component. Okay. Um, and immediately, once we have these interfaces, we can look at them and we can say, OK, the add is a combinational component because the output is available in the same cycle as the input. Right? We've got this power to express and sort of talk about uh, why this adder is sort of somehow different from a multiplier, which if you look at its interface, uh, whoops, look at its inf interface, uh, it sort of produces its output three cycles after the inputs are provided, right? So now we can look at these signatures and we're like, all right, adders are somehow fundamentally different from multipliers. And so these signatures can now capture the temporal property of your interface. Uh, that, that they're somehow different. Like if you look at the add signature, it's somehow fundamentally different from multipliers, and that's why they're they have different behaviors associated with them. So now that we have these, uh, these sort of signatures uh, on hand, let's try to build our ALU again. And so again, we have you know, our signatures for the add and mul, and we define the signature for ALU as it expects all of its inputs in the first cycle, it produces its output in the first cycle. right? That's what, that's what that signature is saying. OK, instantiating things in, uh, in filament is sort of straightforward. You just use this new keyword, and you, you say, I'm going to build a new uh, circuit that is an adder. Right? The funky thing that filament has to talk about is called an invo uh, invocation. Right? And so the way to read an invocation is that we take the circuit A, which is an adder. It's an instance of an adder. And we're going to start running it when the event g happens. So somehow we get a handle to the event g. Maybe there's a signal somewhere. In fact, that's exactly how it's implemented. So there's some signal that says that g has happened now. And that's exactly when the circuit A will perform a computation with the inputs l and r. This language of schedules is extremely restrictive. You can only say g, or you can say g plus n, where n is a constant, a compile time constant. And this sort of comes to one of the big limitations with Filament, is that it only talks about statically scheduled hardware. It cannot talk about dynamic pipelines. And we'll, we can sort of discuss uh, what that would look like in the future. So once you sort of schedule all of your computations with these invocations, the other funky thing is that you don't get to read outputs on an instance. You read the outputs on a particular invocation. And so the reason we have this instance invocation separation is because you can use that adder circuit multiple times with multiple different inputs at multiple different points of time. And those will all have different outputs that are valid at different points in time. So what, what, you, what these invocations are letting you do is sort of have a temporally named use of your circuit. Uh, when we compile, we're, we're going to build some sort of simple muxing logic to make sure you get all of your signals correctly. Um, but that's, that's sort of the big difference in filament, and it's the only difference in filament from sort of a traditional ASDL. So now that we have all of this machinery, we can look at this program. And we run the filament compiler, and this is what it will tell us. This is, this is not me sort of giving you high level intuition of why this is wrong. This is the exact error message that the filament compiler will give you, which is that, hey, you're, using, you're trying to build this design. The multiplexer is a sort of a com combinational com component, which means it expects all of its inputs in the same cycle. But the weird thing you're doing is that the adder and the op are available in the correct cycles, but the output from the multiplier is available in the wrong cycle. right? The multiplier is taking three cycles to produce its output. The adder is taking one cycle to produce its output. Your pipeline is imbalanced. You're going to do the wrong thing if you try to run the circuit. And you know, if we look at the signature of, of these modules, we can, we can sort of tell the mux expects its inputs in the, in the cycle. So if we sort of look at that g and replace that g with that other g, I should have used different names. Um, R is expected in g to g plus 1, but the multiplier output because the multiplier is also scheduled at time g, is going to arrive at g plus 3. So that's just saying that the multiplier is, a, is sort of a sequential component. It was going to take multiple cycles to produce its output. 
nominally, we had this like image of our hardware at the start, but actually it's sort of more like this. The multiplier t is taking more time, and so you need to somehow balance your pipeline, right? And so again, some basic stuff, but the way you balance pipelines is you, you use registers. And so here's one model of registers, is that you have some input, you have an enable signal, the clock ticks, you get the output. And so the way we describe the behavior of things like registers often is these waveform form diagrams. We sort of say the way the register works is defined by this particular waveform diagram, right? And so let's see how filament can allow you to express the same information that that waveform uh, provides using a signature. So here's the signature for a register. The first thing is that it's an externally defined component. Filament doesn't know how to implement registers. It says there's some Verilog somewhere sitting that implements a register, and I'm just going to give it a type. I don't know how to use, I don't know how to build registers. I just know how to give it a type. And in fact, Filament doesn't have any primitives at all. Everything, sort of all low level components, including the adder and the multiplier and the register, they're all defined externally. All Filament does is compose things. So let's, let's go through the, the signature of a register. It's sort of already funky and different because it takes two events. So the first sort of important property, oh. yeah, um, the first sort of interesting thing is that the output is available for a user-definable amount of time. The user gets to specify what E is up there. The user can say G plus 1 or G plus 10, and that'll mean hold it for one cycle or 10 cycles, right? And so there's some constraint that the, the thing you provide for E better be greater than g plus 1. You can't say I'm going to hold a signal from g plus 1 to g, because that, that's not a well-formed interval. The next piece of information encoded in the signature is that the outputs are available one cycle after the inputs. right? And so that's, those are the edges that are encoded in this, this part here. The next thing is that the output is held for a user-definable amount of time. The user gets to tell the register component how long you're going to hold on to an output, right? And this is capturing the intuition that registers can truly just like hold on to values for as long as you want them to um, and, and sort of allow you to read them. So if we go back to our design, all we have to do is instantiate a register and say, we're going to hold on to that va value produced by the adder for three cycles. Uh, it's three because you, you sort of the output becomes available in g plus 1, and then it's held up to g plus 4. So that's, that's why it's three cycles. Um, and we'll also sort of make sure that the op is available for multiple cycles, and the multiplexer actually executes sort of three cycles after the adder and the multiplier are scheduled. So with this, we've sort of built a hardware design that is correct, right? Like if you run this, you will get correct output no matter w whether you've done the ad addition or, or the multiplication. So what Filament's type system, this, this whole thing that I've been showing you, has done is that it's ensured that you only read semantically valid signatures. Another way to put it is that you never read unintended x values. You can always read intended x values, but x values will not sort of propagate randomly through your system if you use Filament. Of course, writing a correct design is all well and good, but we want fast designs. So the next step is, how do we pipeline uh, these hardware modules, right? And so the, the sort of fundamental property we need to capture when building pipelined hardware designs is we need to capture the initiation interval of the module. That's sort of the number of cycles before the module can accept a new input. And so this is like a structural constraint. It's a constraint about the physical nature of the circuit that you're using. And so we need some mechanism. Again, if you look at the original component definitions we were working with and something like Verilog, this information is completely absent. Uh, Filament captured some pieces of information that allows you to talk about things like latency, but it also is currently missing this information. So here's the only change you need to do to talk about pipelines and pipeline behavior in Filament. You add this number, and it says the event G can happen every two cycles. right? So there's some sort of signal that is pulsing that corresponds to G, and it can happen every two cycles. And that is all you need to talk about pipelines and their initiation intervals. Okay, So let's use this to build a pipeline ALU. Uh, yeah. So we're going to go into our implementation and we say, OK, the add is a combinational component and can process new inputs every cycle. The multiplier is somehow weird. We don't know its definition. Again, it's some black box implementation, and it can 
process new inputs every cycle, right? Or every other cycle, sorry. And the ALU, we're going to describe our intent. We're going to say, we want to build an ALU that can process new inputs every cycle. And we know this is not going to work out. You know? And so the way, the, the sort of experience we're hoping for is that Filament tells us exactly all of the places in our code that are stopping us from pipelining this module fully. right? And so this is the way a lot of Filament work works. You sort of build a fully combinational or fully sequential design, and you just flip that number, and Filament will tell you why your design cannot be fully pipelined. So let's go through that process. So first, I'll say, hey, you have this op signal that you're holding onto for three cycles. But this sort of the, the requirement that the module executes every cycle, this is, this is not satisfied, satisfiable because op is a physical wire, right? Like if you try to send three inputs onto an op, uh, they're going to sort of clobber each other and you're going to get a malformed pipeline. So the first problem is that you're holding onto op for too long. You must only hold onto it for one cycle, right? And so the first constraint in the system is that the availability of any signal is less than the delay of the module. The, this number is the delay. Uh, so we're going to make sure that op is only available in the cycle we use it, which is g plus 3 to g plus 4. The next thing you'll point out is, hey, you, you, you're using this multiplier that can process new inputs every other cycle, but you want me to process every, uh, a new input every cycle. There's a composition error. Your pipeline internally is running slower than what you want me to be run at, running at. So that's a problem. And that's a problem that cannot be fixed by changing something in the signature. You need to build me a new multiplier. So you use some other circuit called MOL2 that can do, that can sort of um, you know, hold on to process new inputs every cycle. And that's the other problem. The final problem is, is sort of related in that this register is holding on to its value for four cycles. But registers are different from multipliers in that they can actually just hold values for a user-definable amount of time. But because we're holding on to a signal for three cycles, we're again not going to be able to pipeline. A register that holds on to values for three cycles cannot accept new inputs every cycle. Right? And so the change here is instantiate three new registers, uh, sort of shift value through them. And now you sort of finally have a hardware design that is fully pipeline and it is correct. Um, and so you know, event delays are capturing the structural property. And that's, that's sort of the important part of uh, Filament. So, Filament is this language that captures temporal and structural properties um, for, for your circuits. Uh, the other funky thing, uh, I think this was also in the Chisel talk yesterday, is that we really care about the error messages. Like I was showing you all of these uh, nice error messages. They're not made up. We spend a lot of effort making sure that the error messages provide some piece of information. Uh, and we sort of have this uh, in, our, in our sort of build manifesto that like bad error messages are con considered a bug in the compiler, right? Um, and this is important because you know, a lot of the experience of writing programs in these typed languages is that you get a lot of errors. right? In some ways, people are like, ah, I, I should just write system error log. It doesn't give me errors. Well, that's kind, of, that's kind of a problem. right? It lets you build garbage things, whereas Filament will not let you build garbage things, but it will give you complex error messages. So we, we, make sure, we try to make sure that the error messages that you, that you get are sort of meaningful and useful. There's one, one sort of piece of uh, experience I want to show you that we, we use uh, Filament in, in the evaluation for, uh, of uh, Filament in our paper, which is that we took this other paper, uh, Reticle, um, which is basically a language and a compiler that lets you efficiently use FPGA primitives. And so Reticle's superpower is that it takes DSPs in, in your FPGAs, which are these like circuits that are performing efficient numerics operations, and can build really nice cascades out of them. So if you want to do dot product, Reticle is the language that will help you do really, really good dot products in your implementation. And so our idea was, hey, Filament is really good at giving types to external Verilog modules. right? It's an integration language. Uh, so what if we build something in Reticle, we sort of wrap it in a Filament type, and then use it from a Filament source code? So let's first give a, a, a design generated by Reticle a type. So here's, here's sort of a computation that's like, a0 times B0 plus A1 times B1 plus blah, 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 and then plus accumulate at the end. And so the first time I tried to do this, this is the type I ended up with that sort of gave me the correct outputs. But then I remembered the guy who built the reticle compiler is an actual architect unlike me. So this is, this is not going to be the case because like, it's processing new inputs every three cycles. That's problematic. It, should, it better be pipelined if it's going to be efficient. 
And so in fact, the way to give the correct type to this DSP is that the inputs are staggered in time. The first set of inputs are required in the first cycle, the second set of inputs in the second cycle, and the third set of inputs in the third cycle, right? So these funky staggered uh, interfaces are not just implementation details leaking through your, your Verilog modules. It's actually important that they are staggered so you can pipeline things and process them. And so once you give them these types, you can sort of go do an evaluation or something. And so we built a bunch of designs. The design marked with filament actually uses Xilinx's IP core uh, to generate multiply, multiplication primitives, which are again given types using the filament language and then integ integrated in sort of a black box manner. And so if you use filament reticle, you do, you'll notice that the LUT usage is sort of an order of magnitude lower than the other designs. And so this is really the superpower of, of filament and filament-like languages is that they are a language for a safe integration, safe and efficient integration. Um, there's no overhead to any of the filament programs. Once the types check, we just erase them and generate fast hardware for you. So again, filament is uh, a language for temporal and structural properties and it enables uh, efficient composition. The final thing I want to tell you is that recently we've been working on doing sort of building safe hardware generators, right? So no one ever builds one piece of circuit. You always want them to be parameterized in some way. And so what filament lets you do is specify parameters and then it checks the definition itself. It doesn't check sort of uses of that, that module. It, it will go and prove that for all values of n, this shift register will generate a well pipeline module. So what this means is that if you sort of can write a design and make sure it type checks, any set of parameters you give it will be correctly pipelined. It's quite a strong property, right? In, in sort of chisel land, chisel land what, a, what sort of the type system tells you is that if you, uh, if you uh, can type check the module, any parameter will ensure that your bit widths are, are going to sort of line up. Filament is sort of going one step ahead and saying, any parameter you give me is going to give me a well pipeline module. It'll make sure that your pipelines are balanced correctly, right? And so we're using this to build modules that can be sort of retimed at the, at the top level and, and still be correct because the retiming is just exposed as this parameter at the top and you can tweak it however you like and it'll make sure because it was proven sort of in an abstract matter um, that your internal pipelines are going to remain balanced and correct. So with that, I'll, I'll sort of conclude my talk. There is a paper, there is an open source repository if you're curious. I'll also plug in my other piece of work, uh, which is Calyx, this compiler infra infrastructure for accelerator generators. I will not talk about it. Um, but come, come grab me uh, during the breaks or something, and I'm happy to chat about either of these projects. Thank you. So we're a little bit behind time for the break, um, but if there's a quick question, otherwise, Rich is going to be here, so you can just ask him during the break. OK, I'll, I'll ask the quick question then. Um, how about type, infer uh, type inference? Like, Can you infer any additional stuff here? Because you've got lots of types that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise? Yeah, so the, the sort of this scheduling thing that we were doing where you run the mux at a particular time, that can be fully inferred. We don't do it. Um, you will still need to provide things like signatures at the mo module boundaries. We haven't really explored type inference. We're actually working on the parametric stuff first, and then when the type infer uh, inference problem is as, as complex as it can get, we're going to solve the whole thing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's go and have some coffee. Okay.